The next item of business is members' business debate on motion 8960 in the name of Maurice Golden on electric shock training callers in Scotland. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. And may I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Maurice Golden to open the debate up to seven minutes, please, Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, be under no illusion, electric shock collars are ham harmful and must be banned. For that reason, I am delighted to see the SNP have listened to me and the 20,000 other people who signed my petition calling for such a ban. Part of our role in Parliament as an effective opposition is to hold the government to account, but it is also to influence Scottish Government policy. The Scottish Conservatives have led the way on this issue and the SNP Government have listened. However, this is first and foremost a victory for animal welfare in Scotland, a victory for the countless animal charities, trainers and members of the public who have campaigned for this result. I also want to recognise the cross-party support this issue has received with a representative from every party in the Parliament supporting a ban. Mark Ruskell. Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the member for giving way, and I appreciate the work that he has done personally on this issue. Will he also be putting pressure on the Westminster Government to enforce a ban on the sale and distribution of shock collars? Because without that, we don't really have a ban in Scotland. Uh, Maurice Golden. I I'll address that point in probably about two and a half minutes. So uh, feel free to come and uh, intervene again if I do not fully explain it. Um, but I'm confident I will. Uh, whilst welcome uh, yesterday's announcement, there is still a, a need for clarity. We need to know if this is a complete ban applying to all harmful training devices. For example, arguments have been made that those with varying settings might be treated differently. Clarity is also needed on the consultation with animal welfare organisations, a move I support, but which also raises concerns. The SNP's previous electric shock collar consultation initially offered the prospect of a ban only to result in a proposal for regulation. There needs to be clarity on who will be consulted this time, how long the process uh, will last and what uh, is going to be consulted on. There must be no attempt to use the consultation process to, to water down the ban using arguments we sometimes hear, such as shock collars being necessary for deaf dogs, when in fact non-shock vibrating collars could be used as a viable alternative. Equally, the idea that livestock chase training is a justification for using electric shock collars is refuted by DEFRA research showing the effectiveness of positive reinforcement in such training. Significantly, there is a need for clarity on the legal aspect of the ban, notably how courts will enforce it. The guidance to be issued will be advisory and judges will not be bound to take it into account. I would welcome the initial thoughts from the Cabinet Secretary today and further details on this in due course. But uh, addressing Mark Ruskell's earlier intervention, we must also consider the issue of banning the import and sale of electric shock collars. Although I believe that the implementation of the guidance released yesterday will effectively ban these harmful devices in Scotland, I am supportive of going one step further. That is why I have written to the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs to urge him to look into this matter. Moreover, my colleague Ross Thompson, a dog owner and, and dog lover, indeed a former member of this parliament, has also pledged to lead efforts in Westminster to ban these harmful devices. Uh, but let us remember why banning these devices is, is really so important. These are harmful devices that have no place in dog training. The premise is very simple. Electric shock collars and other electronic pulse training aids work by delivering a shock with the intention that that shock becomes associated with a specific behaviour to deter that behaviour from being repeated. It sounds so reasonable. Strip away the polite sounding description and you're left with the facts that these devices electrocute dogs. It's not right and it's not fair. Unsurprisingly, 
electrocuting dogs can result in long-term harm. A 2013 study by DEFRA highlighted these negative impacts. One in four dogs trained with these devices showed signs of stress compared with fewer than one in 20 where positive training methods were used. It was also shown that long-term impacts were still present even when the collars were used by professionals trained to industry standard. That last point is particularly significant as regulation of the use of these electric shock collars would not work, even if only allowed by qualified trainers. Instead, we can focus on what does work, rewards-based training. This is already successfully used by many organizations such as Blue Cross, who believe it is only the only effective approach, or the Dogs Trust, who last year rehomed 1,000 dogs in Scotland using rewards-based training, or Battersea Dog and Cats Home, who have some of the most experienced canine behaviorists available and who support using only positive training methods. In fact, they will not rehome an animal with anyone who plans to use adverse, aversive training techniques. These organizations, along with the Kennel Club, the Scottish Kennel Club, the SSPCA, the Animal Behaviour and Training Council, Edinburgh Dog and Cat Home, and others too numerous to mention, have been crucial in keeping this issue in the spotlight, not forgetting the more than 20,000 people who signed my petition. To all of them, I say thank you. We achieved our goal, we made a difference, now let's make sure we see that difference delivered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Golden. We move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of no more than four minutes, please. And I call Christine Graham to be followed by Colin Smith. Uh, I thank, uh, congratulate Morris Golden, presiding officers, in securing this debate, and indeed Ben McPherson on his parallel motion. Can I also advise the Chamber, and with your consent, presiding officer, I'll have to leave immediately after my contribution as I chair the convener's group at some time around 1pm. Returning home late last night from a burn supper, I learned that the Scottish Government were now supporting a ban on the use of electronic shock collars. Now, both Morris Golden and Ben McPherson are new blood here. So I want to pay tribute to Kenny Gibson, who can't be here because he's chairing a cross-party group, to Alison Johnson, long-time campaigners like myself for a ban on the use of electronic shock collars since at least 2011. I also commend Colin Smith, who has also pursued a ban since he came into Parliament. I would also add that quite apart from all the animal charities, One Kind, SSPC, Dogs Trust, additionally the Kennel Club and others, I'd think the cross-party group on animal welfare, which I chair, will welcome this announcement. Indeed, on 8 January, three years ago, I led a members' debate entitled A Shocking Way to Treat a Dog. I said gently to Morris Golden that at that time, not one Conservative member signed my motion for a ban on the use of electronic shock collars. And the government at that time were not disposed to follow the lead of Wales, banning the use since 2010. I therefore welcome not only the government's change of heart, but the conversion at least of some members of the Conservative Party, because for me, animal welfare issues, in some instances, should be matters of individual conscience. And I invite Morris Golden to join the cross-party group on animal welfare as we have more work to do. And we're a very proactive group, as the Cabinet Secretary knows. Now to the nitty gritty. I note the terms of the Cabinet Secretary's press release and I welcome the guidance. But I note that in Wales, the ban was on use was secured by regulation. So my questions are, which I will take, read later in the official report, will that be the route the Scottish Government takes of choice and can it be achieved through the Animal Wel and Welfare Scotland Act 2006? The Welsh regulations apply also to cats. And I quote from the Welsh regulations, the regulations ban the use of any collar that is capable of ministering an electric shock to a cat or dog. Now, I know the Cabinet Secretary is very much a cat lover and has one for many years, so I suspect she'll be sympathetic to this. If it's by regulation, however, how long will that take, broadly speaking? That should be faster than going in primary legislation. And if it's not going to be by regulation, 
What by, what by other means? A standalone bill, a member's bill. Like Morris Golden, I too am afraid, Mr. Golden, there's nothing you near. I had an event after debate three years ago when MSPs were encouraged to try electronic shop callers on their wrists. Only a few turned up, but I can tell you, and I hope they do this for you, when they did, they were converted on the spot. You see, I've had pets all my adult life, a dog and a series of cats. And believe it or not, as I've said, they are subject to electronic shop callers. I would think no more of using a shop caller on my lovely and indomitable Mr. Smokey than on myself, though some might think the latter wouldn't be a bad idea. Training by pain and not persuasion is just plain wrong. And now that cross-party and government impetus is here, I congratulate again all the petitioners, all the par parliamentarians here and in the past who've been in this parliament, who've never given up, given up on banning their use. And I thank Maurice Golden for bringing the debate and the government in particular for undertaking now to see the ban become a reality while I am still here. Thank you. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer, uh, and thank you to Maurice Golden for his motion today. Labour support for a, a full ban on electric shock collars is a, is a consistent and long-standing position. There is, President Officer, no place in the 21st century for the use of these barbaric devices. In recent months, it's been a hugely encouraging sight to see more and more MSPs come forward to support that position, a position I know shared by many members across parties. The evidence that shows these devices cause distress, anxiety and emotional harm to dogs is clear for everyone to see, as is the evidence that the range of highly effective, positive training methods available render these collars needless. If you look at the work of a charity such as Battersea Dogs and Cats Home, they've been in existence for over 150 years. The dogs they've cared for and rehomed over 15 decades often displayed the most difficult behaviour, yet they achieve incredible and lasting results positive and reward-based Not only are the positive alternatives to sending a painful electric current through the neck of a dog to frighten them into obedience more humane and effective, there is a growing body of evidence suggesting that the use of shock collars is actually counterproductive. It was clear from the answers, or I have to say rather non-answers I received from the government to a series of written questions I tabled last year on shock collars that the government's initial approach to try to regulate such collars not only ignored this evidence, it was frankly unworkable. And the proposal to, in effect, create a qualification in cruelty for trainers was simply abhorrent. Presiding officer, you cannot regulate cruelty. I therefore welcome the announcement by the government yesterday that they now plan to ditch that existing policy. The question now is, is the new approach proposed by the government to issue guidance under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 strong enough to prevent the full use of shock collars? Under the Act, it's an offence to, to cause unnecessary suffering to an animal or to fail to meet its welfare needs. But at present, it would be almost impossible to prosecute on these grounds for using a shock collar. The proposal to issue guidance under the Act stating that, the, that aversive techniques, including shock collars, does add some clarity to the Act. But is it strong enough to result in prosecution? Charities such as the Dogs Trust, although welcoming the change of direction by the government, have understandably said they would prefer a ban to be introduced under Section 26 of the Act. A ban using secondary legislation would mean just that, a ban. The proposed guidance from the government states that a person may be committing an offence of unnecessary suffering if they use a shock collar, but equally they may not be. The onus would remain on the prosecution to demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt not just that a collar had been used, but actually unnecessary suffering had been caused, and that is still a high threshold. So I hope that when summing up in the debate, the Cabinet Secretary will be able to share with the Chamber whether she believes the proposed guidance has the same legal status as, for example, the approach of the Welsh Government who used secondary legislation to lead the way in the UK by banning the use of shock collars, and why guidance is the approach being taken by the government. If the answer is simply speed, then there's no reason why guidance cannot be a temporary measure until a more robust approach through secondary legislation is adopted. In concluding, presiding officer, I know many politicians may want to take credit for the government's welcome change of position on this issue. However, I want to pay tribute to animal welfare charities such as the Kennel Club, the Dogs Trust, Battersea Dogs and Cats Home, One Kind and Blue Cross for the campaign and what they and their supporters have done to achieve this change and for the outstanding work they and other charities do 
advocating for animals on a whole host of issues. There is much still to do. I hope yesterday's announcement by the government will signal further changes in policy, such as reversing the deeply regrettable decision to lift the ban on tail docking. We have a consultation on the banning of snaring, and we have a commitment to go beyond Lord Bonamy's recommendations and ensure a proper ban on hunting. I hope we will soon see the proposed legislation raising animal cruelty sentences in line with the campaign by Battersea Dogs and Cat Home and others. If we do see those changes, then I can assure the government they will have the full support of all Labour MSPs and, more importantly, they will have the full support of the public. Thank you. I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like many others, I firmly believe that electronic shop collars for dogs are inherently cruel and totally unnecessary. And so I'd like to thank Maurice Golden for securing a debate on this very important animal welfare <coughs> issue. And it is great to join with colleagues to welcome the Scottish Government's bold and decisive decision and action yesterday to promptly and effectively ban the use of electric shock collars here in Scotland and also ban other electronic aid, training aids capable of causing pain or distress to dogs. As members are aware, this is an issue that I've also been campaigning on recently, together with key animal welfare organisations, including One Kind, Battersea, Dogs and Cats Home, the Dogs Trust, the Kennel Club, Blue Cross and the Scottish SPCA. I pay tribute to all of their work on this issue, to fellow MSPs who've campaigned for change, and in particular to Christine Graham, who has been a champion on this issue for some time. But most of all, I pay tribute to the Cabinet Secretary for acting responsibly and decisively on the basis of evidence and ethics to make it clear yesterday that causing pain to dogs through inappropriate training methods will not be tolerated here in Scotland and that electric shock collars and other electronic training aids will be banned by the SNP. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has listened to legitimate views and opinions on both sides of this issue. It has taken careful consideration, recognising growing public concerns. That's abs absolutely my understanding. And there is no doubt that the Cabinet Secretary's announcement yesterday will create a full ban on the use of electronic training devices for dogs here in Scotland. A ban that is prompt, effective and legally robust under guidance being developed under Article 38 of the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006. And in my view, putting my old lawyer hat on, this is a, a, an effective way to make sure that it is not unnecessarily vulnerable to judicial review. Presiding officer, members will also be aware that I circulated my own petition and motion on this issue and uh, did not support Maurice Golden's motion. While I, of course, agree with the general call for a ban in Mr. Golden's motion and, 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 congrats, and pay tribute to him for that. I wasn't able to support his wording because it included a significant inaccuracy. With respect, Mr. Golden's motion falsely states that Wales has banned the sale of shock collars, when of course the Welsh Assembly, like the Scottish Parliament, does not have the power to do that. Only the Conservatives at Westminster can now ban the sale of electric shock collars here in Scotland, in Wales and across the UK because the ability to ban the sale of these cruel devices is fully reserved to Westminster. Therefore, like others have done, I am also calling on the UK Government, together with my Westminster colleagues in particular, Tommy Shepherd and Deirdre Brock MP, who's lodged an early day motion at Westminster, I'm calling on the UK government to follow Scotland's example and use its reserved powers to ban the sale and distribution of cruel electric shock collars. Because at the moment, you can buy these cruel devices easily and cheaply, and that needs to stop. And it's up to the Westminster government to step up and do that. So in good faith, I welcome and support Mr. Gold and other Conservative MSPs who will put pressure on their colleagues and be part of a collective effort to pressurise the Tory UK government to do the right thing now because it's time to ban electric shock collars completely across the UK. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Tom Arthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. If I can declare an interest as an honorary member of the British Veterinary Association, and can I join members in also thanking 
Maurice Golden for bringing this issue to Parliament, um, ahead of any eruptions we might have had on this issue in, in the committee, um, and can also thank the cross-party work that's been done in this Parliament for a number of years to build the case against uh, electric shock collars and, and the fantastic work of the animal charities that we have in Scotland as well. Um, presiding officer, I believe that we should avoid punishment when training a dog as it teaches response out of fear. This is bad for its welfare and can cause behavioural problems later in life. Um, not my words, but the words from the Scottish Government's existing code of practice on the welfare of dogs. So I'm pleased that the government has recognised, as the Welsh Government has already, that even a regulated use of electric shock collars is wholly inconsistent with its own approach to animal welfare that's embedded in the current guidance. And the evidence, of course, shows that punishment does not work. For example, one major behavioural research study that surveyed and filmed owners and dogs found that punishment led dogs to become less playful, less likely to interact positively with a stranger. It also found that dogs trained using a more patient, reward-based approach were more able to learn a novel training task. So punishment affects both a dog's behavior and its ability to learn. And the scientific evidence has built up over the years on e-collars, specifically in the case against them. A University of Utrecht study, for example, showed that dogs, quite unsurprisingly, when subjected to shocks, show clear signs of stress, fear and pain, leading to long-term stress-related behavior. And we've already heard about the recent DEFRA studies that have again reinforced this, showing negative behavior with the use of e-collars, even when training was conducted by professional trainers using the lighter touch training regimes. So there is, of course, uh, a small but vocal lobby of e-collar advocates I'm sure I've been bombarding uh, members' email inboxes. And just as there was a vociferous lobby of working dog owners who believed that there was a welfare benefit to amputating hundreds of puppy dog tails to prevent the amputation of a single adult dog's tails. And there was a point towards the end of last year where the Scottish Government was in danger once again of tying itself up in, uh, in knots by pandering to this lobby, creating vocational qualifications in the use of aversive training aids, a kind of NVQ in torture. But to be honest, I could never really see my local college offering this as a positive destination for school leavers. It's never a viable option. So the government's fresh move to update the guidance, making it clear that aversive techniques can compromise dog welfare, is absolutely the correct approach. It adds clarity and makes it more likely that prosecutions can take place under the Animal Health and Welfare Act. My only question at this point to the Cabinet Secretary is about the timescale for its introduction. The Scottish Government has acted within the limits of their powers, but it is now vital, as other members have said, that Westminster Government uses its powers to ban the sale and distribution of e-collars. Every time I Google the word shock collars, I'm bombarded by adverts encouraging me to buy them, alongside trainers offering shock services. Public awareness is low, and the implications of using e-collars need to be spelled out to responsible pet owners who may be unaware of the evidence and their legal responsibilities. Unscrupulous owners and trainers using these devices are going to be incredibly difficult to catch and prosecute without an accompanying ban on the sale and distribution brought in on the same time scale as this amendment to guidance. And I think there's a critical point here in terms of the MPs and the lobbying at Westminster. We need to see both governments moving together. The Scottish Government has set the bar here. The Westminster Government now needs to follow. And I do hope that pressure can be exerted on a cross-party, a genuine cross-party basis uh, to bring this about. Tom Arthur, followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, uh, presiding officer, and I'd like to begin by uh, thanking Maurice Golden for bringing this matter to the chamber and congratulating him on securing the debate. I also wish to pay tribute to my friend and colleague Ben McPherson for his work in this issue, which is um, where well, we all have, a, 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 I think, across the parliament, a shared view in this matter. Ben's work has helped to refine the argument, um, and I, I commend the Scottish Government on the action they have taken, which I, having considered the, the evidence carefully, I, I, I agree is the, the correct position. Um, as Mark Ruskell uh, said, I don't think there's any of us who have not been bombarded by um, a range of groups with different views. Um, and I've taken the opportunity within my surgeries in my office to meet with people from both sides of the argument. Um, and, and what struck me is that 
I, I, I was struck by the sincerity of, of trainers on both sides of the particular argument. Both are ultimately concerned with the welfare of um, dogs. Both are concerned with ensuring that dog owners can be responsible dog owners in, the, in regards to the people who I met. And what it underscored to me actually is that in this argument is the, the challenge is not in terms of correcting dogs' behaviour um, when it gets to a stage where people would justify using shock collars. It's actually about preventing dogs' behaviour getting to that stage. Now, I had a, an interesting um, a, a range of submissions and there was one um, dog owner who had used um, a shock collar on a, on a puppy and, and the argument that this, this owner made was that this helped to uh, quickly address a behavioural problem of the puppy and was far more humane than taking the dog to puppy classes where it would be terrified by 30 other puppies. Now, I should declare an interest as a dog owner myself. One of the most important things you do with a puppy is socialisation. You engage it with other dogs, you engage it with other human beings. And what that really spoke to me and said to me was that the great deal of misinformation and misunderstanding that exists. And so really the approach has to be about positive methods of, of, of training dogs. But it's about early intervention, it's about encouraging responsible ownership. And, and buying a dog doesn't just start with collecting the puppy or putting down a deposit. It should start months before with research, understanding the breed, understanding the issues relating to dog, um, identifying and engaging with um, reputable breeders. So all of that is um, in incredibly important. And I think it's, it's, it's also important more broadly because having that preventative approach of, of responsible ownership, of informed ownership, it doesn't only create a situation which um, vitiates the need for shock collars as some people would perceive it. It prevents a whole range of other problems that can emerge as well because while shock collars do cause pain and distress to animals, to dogs, there's a range of many, many other activities and, and issues that emerge that cause a lot more pain and distress. Um, I, saying this as a dog owner, my wife and I have a, have a pug um, not what one would maybe necessarily think is a, is a dangerous dog in need of a shock collar, although their capacity to sort of you know, follow around at your feet they can be a trip hazard. But what I would say is that um, pugs as a breed, nearly every pug that you see is, is, is kind of overweight. You know, we know of an obesity crisis um, in, in Scotland, we have an obesity crisis with pugs. And why is that? It's because people aren't in, informed about uh, who owners who allow their dogs to become to that way are not informed about actually what the welfare of the dog is. The welfare of the dog is not treating it and rewarding it and giving in to these pleading eyes. It's about responsible dog ownership, about making sure the dog's properly exercised, it's properly fed. And that is just one example where responsible, of what actually responsible dog ownership is. And my view is that if we have a culture where more people are responsible dog owners from um, when dogs are puppies, then we're not going to have these behavioural problems later in their life. And I think it on that basis, I would argue the government has made the correct decision and that the focus for all dog owners and with the incredible um, a range of support that's available from uh, dog welfare charities is that ultimately the, the solution to all kind of behavioural problems is by not letting them develop in the first place. Thank you. We have two final open debate contributions. Finlay Carson followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would firstly like to congratulate Maurice Golding for securing today's important members' debate. As the Scottish Conservative spokesman for animal welfare, I welcome the opportunity to speak today on this important issue and condemn the use of electronic shock collars and other pain-based training devices. Electronic shock collars, sometimes described as versive training devices, work by using discomfort or fear to train a dog. Electric shock collars, or ECSs, are worn around a dog's neck and work by delivering electric shock, either, either via remote control or delivered automatically, to the dog to correct an, undesired, an undesirable behaviour. These devices do nothing other than inhibit the expression of behaviour by creating a fear response. Dogs show behaviour for various reasons. A dog's only way to communicate is by barking, growling or running away. And if we try and stop a dog from communicating, we're not addressing why the dog is choosing to express itself as it is, which can sometimes be a fear response to something it's uncomfortable with. Recent research commissioned by DEFRA showed that there were significant long-term negative welfare consequences for a proportion of dogs that were trained using these ESCs. 
One in four dogs showed signs of stress compared to less than 5% of dogs reacting to positive training methods. One in three dogs yelped at the first use of an electronic collar and one in four yelped at subsequent uses. The research concluded that even when ECSs were used by professionals following an in industry set standard, there were still long-term negative impacts on dog welfare. The study also demonstrated that positive reinforcement methods were effective. For example, in treating livestock chasing, which is the most commonly cited justification for their use, particularly in rural Scotland. Now, I don't for one minute believe that trainers or dog owners who currently, and excuse the pun, use ECSs, they don't have any intention of harming their dogs. I believe it's the exact opposite. They love their dogs as much as anyone else. However, we are now a society who looks, who looks far more closely at our relationships with animals. The decision to ban these devices is in many ways down to the change in public opinion and attitudes. Indeed, it was just that change in attitude that recently brought about the bill banning wild animals in travelling circuses, a practice which many years ago wouldn't have raised an eyebrow. However, today it's totally unacceptable to use wild animals for public entertainment. In modern society, to a far greater extent than in the past, we make our arguments with regards to animals not solely on evidence-based science, but also on moral grounds. The Scottish Government launched a consultation on banning or regulating the use of electronic training aids at the end of 2015. The consultation covered remote control training collars, anti-bark collars and pet containment fences using either a static electric pulse, sound vibration, water or citronella sprays. An independent survey commissioned by the Kennel Club in 2015 found that 73% of the Scottish public are against the use of electronic shock collars and 74% would support a government ban. Now, up till yesterday, the government of Corset were considering some sort of licensing policy based on a qualification, which would still have allowed electric collars to be used in some cases. However, I believe that to simply regulate this cruel act is paramount to supporting its use. I'm delighted that my colleague Morris Golden's campaign uh, and indeed the fact that we're here having this debate today has brought pressure on the government and I sincerely hope that evidence and representation made in Morris's campaign will persuade, persuade the government to introduce appropriate legislation to bring in a total ban. It's still unclear how the ban will be enforced and I welcome some clarification. Deputy Presiding Officer, I would like to thank the many individuals and organisations who provided briefings for this debate, particularly Battersea's Dog and Cat Home and the Dogs Trust. I look forward to seeing the government take action to ban, these event, uh, to ban these devices in the near future. This outdated method of training needs to be put to rest and awareness of more effective uh, manner endorsed, uh, more effective uh, ways to uh, train dogs are endorsed and promoted. Thank you. The last open debate contribution is to Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking um, Maurice Golden for bringing today's important subject um, of debate to the Chamber. There are MSPs right across this Parliament who care deeply about animal welfare and <coughs> will achieve lots if we work together. Of course, the fight against electric shock collars has now been won in Scotland, something I warmly welcome, but it remains to be won in the United Kingdom. So although the motion doesn't refer to the UK government's failure to act to date, I welcome today's opportunity to make the case for banning the sale and supply of electric shock collars throughout the UK. Before that, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate my colleague Ben McPherson on his own extensive and tireless campaigning on this issue, not least through his online petition, which calls on both the Scottish and UK government to take what action they can to ban harmful devices. Ben McPherson deserves a lot of credit for the very welcome shift in policy announced by the Scottish Government yesterday when it made clear that it will introduce an outright ban on electronic training devices that cause pain or distress to dogs. The Scottish Government also deserves credit for the fact that it has clearly listened to, taken on board and responded to people's concerns in its very welcome shift to an outright ban. Both Scotland and Wales have now concluded that the best way to protect animal welfare is to ban electric shock collars, and it's crucial that we now turn our attention towards pressuring the UK government to use its power to ban the sale and supply of these harmful devices across the UK. Presiding officer, the arguments against allowing the sale and supply of electric shock collars are the same as those against allowing their use. 
Electric shock collars are cruel and they're ineffective. They're bad for animal welfare and they don't work. Taking welfare, welfare first, as well as the immediate pain and distress caused by the electric shock, dogs are likely to suffer long-term adverse effects which mean that future attempts at positive reinforcement-based training are likely to be rendered ineffective. Just as importantly, evidence from animal welfare charities, as well as the majority of professional trainers, makes clear that the only effective way to train a dog is through positive enforcement. In the interests of both animal welfare and effective training, I wholeheartedly agree with the Dogs Trust that under no circumstances should we condone the use of equipment or techniques that cause pain or fear to train a dog. The no circumstances part is important there because the only way to make clear that adverse training is completely immoral and ineffective is to ensure that it's never used at all. And, that's, and we need to ban the sale and supply of these devices altogether. That's unfortunately something that only the UK government has the power to do. So in the spirit of Maurice Golden's original motion, which condemned electric shock, collar tra shock training collars as both harmful to a dog's well-being and ineffective as training aids, I'd like to call on him and his colleagues to use whatever influence they might have with their UK colleagues to urge it to do its part by banning the sale and supply of harmful devices. The Scottish Government have listened and responded and I hope the UK Government can demonstrate that they're listening as much as the Scottish Government has to the compelling arguments against electric shock collars and take action as urgently as we have done here in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, and I call Rosanna Cunningham to respond to the debate. Up to seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding, Thank you, presiding Officer. And uh, it will be quite clear, I think, uh, that the subject of electronic training collars or e-collars is a complex and highly emotive one and a matter of concern to many. There has been deliberation by the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament in previous years, uh, as well as conversations taking place in other parts of the United Kingdom. And I just do want to remind members that the status quo ante is that both north and south of the border, there has been no regulation of their use at all. That was the starting point, and I sought to correct that position, even though the formal consultation had come to no consensus on a way forward. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring the highest standards of welfare for all animals. However, finding the most appropriate way forward on the matter of electronic collars has been challenging. Some avenues were and continue to remain closed to this government, a matter acknowledged by a number of members today including Morris Golden himself, Ben McPherson, Mark Rusko, Ruth McGuire, and uh, possibly others. These items cannot be cleared from our shelves, metaphorically speaking. So following the public consultation in 2015, I did announce plans in the programme for government to tightly control the use of electronic training collars to allow only appropriate use under the supervision of properly qualified dog trainers. And this approach was proposed in light of the continuing mixed views on these devices, along with evidence put before me that modern e-collars provide non-painful settings and can be used as part of a balanced training programme. I consider this approach to be a proportionate response to a complex issue. However, the continuing concern about this proposed approach has led me to review those proposals. And that is why I've decided not to pursue the initial plan to explore a way of approving trainers to allow the continued use of these collars in targeted circumstances, I do know that that will disappoint those owners who genuinely believe that their animals have benefited uh, from these collars and those trainers who have been engaging constructively, uh, constructively with officials. I've therefore asked officials to prepare clear Scottish Government guidance, reiterating that any physical punishment of dogs causing unnecessary suffering is not ex unacceptable in Scotland and is an offence under the 2006 Act. This includes the misuse of electronic collars that administer an electric shock, anti-bark collars and any device that squirts noxious oils or other chemicals or, uh, or, uh, uh, or substances uh, into a dog's uh, face or other part of its anatomy. Now, this guidance will be issued under Section 38 of the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006, 
and will supplement the existing Scottish Code of Practice for the Welfare of Dogs. Draft guidance is already on the Scottish, web, uh, Scottish Government website uh, and I do recommend that uh, members seek it out. The guidance will make clear that causing unnecessary suffering by the use of such devices is an offence. Together with recommendations in the current Code of Practice for the Welfare of Dogs, courts may take into account compliance or non-compliance with the proposed guidance in establishing liability in a prosecution. And this guidance will help support the important work of the frontline enforcement agencies who have the difficult job of dealing with animal welfare problems in Scotland. It will go much further than the current dog welfare code in England, and I think most people would accept that. It will address, also address wider concerns about training devices and methods than are actually dealt with by the legislation in Wales, where I need to caution members that that has resulted in only one prosecution since it was brought in. So there are bigger and more difficult questions around all of this. The draft guidance will no doubt be the subject of further discussion with welfare organisations, particularly those involved in the practicalities of enforcing animal welfare legislation. And I, in particular, encourage the SSPCA to be involved. Consultation is now live, and I think it was Maurice Golden who raised issues about the timescales for this. I can advise consultation is now live and comments are invited by 14th February. Uh, and we will then consult the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee before finalising the wording. So the, ex the intention is to move as quickly as is reasonably possible uh, on this particular issue. In the near future, I do also hope to issue similar guidance on other dog welfare issues, such as the purchase of illegally bred or imported puppies and the breeding of dogs with extreme conformations that lead to chronic suffering because of difficulty uh, breeding, walking or giving birth. And I, uh, I suspect Tom Arthur's beloved pugs may come into the category of animal where that has become a very significant uh, problem. Um, I just wanted to uh, respond to Christine Graham, uh, who um, unfortunately has had to uh, leave to chair another meeting. Um, the guidance at present uh, does not cover cats. Um, I'm happy to consider similar guidance in due course, although I do caution members that electronic uh, collars for cats tend to be used for boundary fence systems, uh, which I think were raised by Finlay Carson, rather than training. And that issue in itself raises different and more complicated issues in respect of electric fencing. Um, in use elsewhere. So I, I think we just need to be uh, a little careful that we understand that cats are in a different category in this particular uh, debate. Um, I think I've probably dealt with most of the specific issues that were raised. Um, so I will conclude, albeit a little early, uh, presiding officer, that I am convinced uh, that issuing timely guidance, and it is going to be timely, under Section 38 uh, of the 2006 legislation will be an effective, practical and immediate way of addressing the legitimate and widespread welfare concerns about collar use in Scotland. Introducing these measures will address the issue of ele electronic collars as quickly as we possibly can, practically, proportionately and crucially with the powers available to us. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Concluding early is always useful on a Thursday lunchtime. And that concludes the debate, and I suspend the meeting until 2.30 p.m.